Top of the morning to everybody. Great to be with you here today in our series on how to master the art of sales. And to me, the single most important skill in sales is listening. I've brought to us today uh, probably um, the man I recognize as the leading expert on this subject in the country. Steve Shapiro is his name. He's written a best-selling book, Listening for Success. A wonderful gentleman, and he has just some great skills. I'm sitting here today with a notepad and pen. I plan to take four to five pages of notes myself. I will share with you after reading his book, Listening for Success. It impacted me as much in my home as it did in my business. So I'm very excited for you to get a chance to listen to Steve and also get a chance to ask him a question, if you will. Three major parts we're going to cover today, and uh, genuinely, Steve, we could probably spend uh, three or four days doing this. But the three questions we're going to cover today is why listen and why people don't listen. So that's the first one to write down. The second is what should we listen for and to? And the third is how do we listen more effectively? I'll say those again so you can write them down. Why listen and then why people don't? What should we listen for and to would be the second major point. And the third, how do we listen more effectively? So why listen? What should we listen for and to? And how do we listen more effectively? Okay, well, with that said, the top of the morning to you, Steve. Just pleased to have you here today. Thanks, Brian. Great to be here. Steve, I want to cut right into it here, and I know we actually have several conference calls worth here, but we're going to try and get it done in one. The very first question I have for you is, why listen? You know, we should listen to our prospects, our customers, our clients, even our family members. We've heard this all a thousand times. We need to listen to our spouse, our kids. But why is it important to listen, and why don't people listen? I think the two main reasons to listen is that it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. and it's the smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so, as you demonstrated very much for me here, because you are trying to get to the essence of what I'm asking you here today, is we know it's smart intuitively. We know we should do it, but yet we don't. We have two ears and one mouth, right? Right. We know we should listen twice as much as we talk. But for most people, most people don't. And I'm sitting here today as a student because I find myself, people come and asking me for questions and advice all the time, and I find myself giving advice all the time. Right. Yet I have done much better in my life when I've listened intentively and attentively and then answered. What is it that stops me? What is it that stops people listening to this tape today? What is it that stops us from listening? Okay, well, it is very rare to meet a listener. Mm -hmm. It's extremely rare and mm -hmm. even more rare to meet a listening salesperson. <laughs> yeah. And that's how I've made my career, mm. built my career because salespeople don't listen. Mm -hmm. I've seen so many deals fall apart, disappear Absolutely. because of one thing that the salesperson didn't listen to. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I'm talking about multi-million dollar telecommunications deals. But let's start with the right thing to do and the okay. smart thing to do. Okay. Listening is the right thing to do. Okay. And what I mean by that, right and wrong is based on a value system. Mm -hmm. But it's the right thing to do if if you believe in caring about people and serving people. Mm. And if you believe that to sell is to serve. Mm. And that's what I believe. They're the same thing. To sell is to serve. If you believe in caring about people, then listening is the right thing to do. Because, Brian, love may be a feeling but it's also an activity. Mm -hmm. And the primary activity of love is listening. Mm. And to sell is to serve, to serve is to love. It's difficult in, in my world, how I define sales, to separate those things. Right. John Steinbeck said, service is a position of power, even of love. I can't understand why more intelligent people don't take it as a career, learn to do it well. Mm. What a great principle. Yeah. And how can you serve it's impossible to serve if you don't know how somebody wants and needs to be served. That's it. And so that's where the right thing to do comes. That's it. You see, most people have a definition of sales. And, and you said something very similar to this. Most salespeople and most people in general have a definition of sales that prevents them from, number one, wanting to be in sales mm -hmm. in the first place. Or number two, if they're in sales, wanting to admit it. Right. And that definition goes like this. Sales is about trying to get someone to do something they don't want to do. Right. And I tell salespeople in my seminars that to the degree that you have that definition, that you hold that in your mind, even if it's unconscious, mm -hmm. 
that sales is about trying to get someone to do something they don't want to do. To the degree that you hold that definition in your mind is the degree to which you will fail at selling. Mm -hmm. Now, we all have that definition to some degree because we've all had salespeople try to get us to do something right. we don't want to do. Absolutely. Everybody can tell you a bad experience. Everyone. We're all burn victims. Right. You know? <laughs> and so one of the most important things a salesperson can do is to redefine sales in their mind so that it gets integrated into every cell of their body. A new definition is required. And I've worked on a definition for 15 years, and this is what I've come up with, that sales is a process of helping people to make decisions which will add to the quality of their life or their business. Mm -hmm. The key phrase is sales is a helping profession. Mm -hmm. You're helping people to make a decision which will add to the quality of their life or their business. Right. And you just said it. How can you help someone to make a decision that's good for them if you don't even know what they believe is good for them? Right. You know, it's interesting you say that because I would say that 99% of the people listening to this call today and subsequently listening to the tape of the thousands of people we have in our program and that we get to meet, I would say 99% of them got into sales explicitly for the reason of serving and helping people. That's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. They want to help somebody. They want to help somebody with their house. They are meet needs type of individuals. That's the type of person they are. And that's why they get into this in the first place. And now the problem is it's almost like it, the secret agenda is to help people because now they have to conform to their peers because it's all about sales. It's all about numbers. It's all about commissions. Right. And so the real reason I mean, even the most hard-nosed driven salespeople I've met, still most of them have a desire to serve and help people. But yet they think that that is actually the secondary thing. I really can't bring that out in public. I got to be a salesman, which is, again, this whole confusing thing about the actual vocation of sales, as opposed to being a profession that's noble. Now, you've trained tens of thousands of people across the country and internationally. You've had all these Fortune 100 companies you've worked with in the past in regards to just your own perspective in sales, because I want to keep some context in here, what do you view as the vocation of sales? I mean, how do you view it as a profession? There's a doctor, there's a dentist, there's a, a surgeon, there's a, uh, someone who works in a ministry, there's someone who's a carpenter, there's someone who's a CPA or an attorney. How do you view the vocation of sales yourself? Nothing happens in the American free enterprise system, mm. which is the greatest system in the world. Mm -hmm until someone makes a sale. Mm -hmm. No sale, no production, no nothing. Right. It is the very basis, the foundation of the American free enterprise system. Mm -hmm. Sales is the greatest profession in the world. It is also happens to be, interestingly enough, the highest paid profession in the world. Hallelujah. And it also happens to be the lowest paid profession in the yeah, world. True. Sales is both the highest paid and the lowest paid profession in the world. Mm -hmm. It's the highest paid hard work right. and the lowest paid easy work. Right. Absolutely. The person behind the counter in the McDonald's is a salesperson. Mm -hmm. But that's easy work because the chances of a sale are 100%. Right. Right. Yeah. That salesperson's <laughs> going to make a sale. You don't yeah. go into a McDonald's to browse. Right. <laughs> you, don't, you don't say, let me see something in a hamburger. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I was looking for something off the cuff. <laughs> right. but, but the people on this call, realtors, real estate agents, real estate professionals, the chances of a sale are not 100%. Right. When they go to a listing presentation, it is not 100%. Sure. And the greater the difficulty or the odds against making a sale, the greater the chances of making more money, being more successful, helping more people, solving bigger problems, and being a part of the highest paid profession in the sure. world. And, and again, the other folks, we have loan folks, we have a group of attorneys, we have people who are in contracting, we have people who are printers, we have one gentleman I know who works on electronic gates in North County in San Diego. <laughs> and every one of us is in this profession of sales. And, and again, even if you're a pastor, you're in the profession of sales. If you're a mother or father. Right. You've got to sell, you've got to convince, and the most powerful thing to convince people with, it seems to be, is take their needs, bring it to light, identify them, expose them, and then help them with a solution that, that's congruent with what they want, but also that meets up with the solution that you actually have available to you. And I want to talk to you in a little further along in this conversation right. about why people don't do that. Right. It seems so obvious when you talk about it, but yeah. we've all heard it. We've why heard why it don't they do it? A couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one is that we were never taught to listen. Mm. 
we didn't learn it from our parents. Mm -hmm. If you learn to listen from your parents, you're in a rare group. Well, now my father is probably the best listener I've ever met in my life. What's interesting about that, by the way, my father's deaf in his left ear. He's deaf in his left ear, and yet he is the best listener I've ever met. Mm -hmm. Now, I saw his example, I lived with him, and I did not pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, because that's not the only reason we don't listen. Right. <laughs> you have some other reasons. Yeah. You know, and, and I have met your father, yeah. and, and uh, he is deaf in one ear. He could be deaf in both ears and still be mm. an excellent listener mm. because you don't have to hear to listen. A couple of the best listeners I've ever come across were deaf people. Wow. Hearing and listening are two different subjects. We'll get to that. You bet. But we were never taught to listen. Most of us didn't learn from our parents, our teachers, our friends. We didn't have role models. Mm -hmm. We are a society of talkers. Right. We've been taught that to be persuasive, convincing, charismatic, you've got to be a good talker. Mm -hmm. To be a good leader, you've got to be a good talker. The fact is that the opposite is actually true. The most charismatic people are the best listeners. Mm. So one reason is is that we were never taught to listen. Here's right. another reason we don't listen. We were taught not to listen. We have actually been taught not to by our role models, by our, our teachers, our parents. We've been taught that, for example, my mother, when she said, listen to me, young man, what did she mean by that? <laughs> it means, I, you know, I don't want you to hear, just do what I'm telling do you to what do. what I say. Yeah. Listen to me, meant do what, and I would say, Mom, I did hear you. I just don't want to do it. But that didn't, <laughs> right, that, that didn't compute for her. So another reason is that we have somehow created the belief that if I listen to you and understand you, then it means that I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And so especially in marriages, when our spouse has something to say to us that we don't want to hear, a criticism right. and a difficulty, a conflict, to actually sit back, get myself out of the way and be there present to hear what she has to say, even if I don't like what I'm hearing, to the degree that I actually understand it and let her know that I understand it. I have this fear that it means I agree with her mm. and that if I let her know I understand, I'm saying I agree with you. If I don't agree, I don't want that to happen. So, But it's a false belief. Sure. Understanding and agreeing are not the same thing. So then the, the fear is... Twofold. Number one, if I agree at this stage, then the next list is starting to get compiled, That's right? right? Yeah. Instantaneously. But wouldn't you also agree it takes a higher level of self esteem and confidence for somebody to look at somebody else and say, I acknowledge that you may have something I don't, or you have a point I really need to grasp, or you actually have to have a certain level of confidence to be able to say, you know what, I'm wrong, or I need help in this area. Humility takes a certain level of strength. And it seems to be that humility and listening have a lot in common. It's a supremely mature act. Mm. It's one of the marks of maturity mm -hmm. of adulthood is to be able to listen and to accept what the other person is saying and consider it to at least consider it, even if I don't like what I'm hearing or agree with what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Fabulous stuff. I mean, that is just it's going to take maturity on our part and the people listening to this tape to be able to even take this stuff in. Wait till we get along a little further because <laughs> okay. I'm going to share something that's going to be hard to hear. <laughs> okay. Let, let, let me get back to you. You asked me why listen. I said it's the right thing to do and the smart thing to do. Yes, we sir. talked about the right thing to yeah. do. Let's talk about why it's the smart thing to do. Okay. One reason it's the smart thing to do is if you're a real estate professional is it's the smart thing to do if you want to sell more homes and list more homes. Mm-hmm then listening is just simply and plainly the, the smart thing to do. You've got to listen if you want to understand what is most important to this client. That's obvious. You know, what's most important to this client in choosing an agent? Mm -hmm. If I don't know that, then I have no advantage. Right. I'm just like any other agent that goes to talk to that client. Mm -hmm. I don't even know. So what are the most important things to this client in choosing a home? Mm -hmm. What are the most important things to this client in selling their property? Dig deeper. What I'm saying is don't assume that you know already. Don't assume that because you've been in this business for 20 years, you know why somebody chooses an agent. Yeah. You know why somebody chooses a property or wants to sell their property. You don't know why. Sure. And guess what? Even if you do, even if you do, and even if you're right, the client still wants to feel like they're the only client you've ever had. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you have to ask questions and listen. Right. 
to find out what's really important to them. That's the smart thing to do. Ask, listen. That's my two-step formula for sales success. Mm -hmm. Ask, listen, ask, listen. They're two sides of the same coin. Most salespeople, Brian, use another two-step formula, (laughs) and I call it the two-step formula for sales failure, and it goes like this. Talk, talk more. (laughs) (laughs) And when there's pauses, fill the pauses. Fill that blank, yeah. yeah. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) You know, it's interesting. I think so many people that I've seen in the business, they've come into a home, and they've immediately gone into a presentation of presumption. And it's, they talk about commissions sometimes. They'll talk about, I'm going to do open houses. I'm going to do ads. And they'll offer things that the client has no interest in whatsoever. They start, here's the presumption of your need. Yes. And always, it's amazing that in every instance I've ever seen that or done it myself, you end up in a situation that not only do they not want to be there, you don't want to be there. You've now offered a bunch of stuff that you really don't want to do because you think it's what they need. And they've never asked for it. It's not even their need. Or it may not have even occurred to them, but now it is an objection. Right. uh, You just gave them one. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, I haven't thought of that one. Yeah, what about commission? You know, what about open houses? Yeah, I was thinking ads might work. You know, I wasn't planning to talk about it tonight. Uh And the next thing you know, now you're fighting, you know, the wrong octopus and trying to get it back in the bag. So... It's the right thing to do. It's a smart thing to do. Where do we go from there? That's in level of acknowledgement. Where can we go from there? What should we listen for and to? How do we go about this? All right. The psychologists have known for a long time that, that people have two reasons for doing the things that they do. Mm-hmm. One is the reason that sounds good. Mm-hmm. And the other is the real reason. Now, psychologists have known that for decades, but a guy named Herb Simon won the Nobel Prize in economics for his work on human decision making hmm. by elucidating how people make decisions. They have the real reason and the reason that sounds good. Which one do you think they give you most of the time? One that sounds good. The reason that sounds good. Mm-hmm. And the reason that sounds good is almost always a logical reason. Mm-hmm. And the real reason is almost always an emotional reason. This is how I feel. You said over and over again, people buy on emotion and justify with logic. Yeah. This is a refinement of what you're saying sure. there. Let me give you an example. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine named Jeff Lang, he's been in real estate sales for 30 years. And he told me this story. He was managing uh, an office and he, one of his agents came in and said, I just cannot get this seller to cooperate. I don't understand. She got a great offer from a qualified buyer, quick escrow, and she won't say yes. He said, I keep telling her, you've got to take this offer. You are not going to get a better offer than this. Mm -hmm. You are not going to get a better qualified buyer. This is going to go through quickly. You're not going to do any better. And she just keeps saying, no, no, I don't I don't want to take it. Well, he says, well, is she giving you any reasons? No, she just won't do it. And she won't talk to me. She won't tell me. She just says, well, I'm going to wait. Hmm. So Jeff (laughs) says, well, let me try. Let me talk to her. So. He went and talked to this woman and he started asking her questions. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about this house and your listing and your life and what's going on. And my agent says that uh, you got a great offer, but you're not really interested in taking it. Tell me about it. Mm -hmm. Starts asking her questions and listening. Well, after a few minutes, she started to tell him the real reason. And the real reason is that this woman was going through a divorce and she had to list the home As part of the divorce settlement, they had to sell the home. She didn't want to sell the home. Right. She didn't even want to get the divorce. Mm -hmm. So here's this woman sitting here emotionally in emotional turmoil, not knowing what to do, where to go, where is she going to go when she sells it? She doesn't want to get rid of this home. Right. It's like getting rid of her life. Right. It didn't have anything to do with the offer. And when she said to him, I can get a better offer, that was the reason it sounded good, but it wasn't the real reason. Mm Mm-hmm. Jeff, by listening to her, got this whole story from her. She started to cry. She opened up. She told him the whole thing. She sobbed. She vented. And he just sat and listened. And when she was done, she said, you know, I should probably take this offer. Where do I sign? Mm -hmm. Sure. She had a chance to talk it through, think it through. Felt safe, probably. Right. Well, you said something powerful in one of your other calls, your last conference call. And it was that clients have three things on their mind. They need three questions answered. Can I trust you? Right. Are you good at what you do? And do you care about me? Mm-hmm. Wow. That's really good stuff. He answered all three of those questions for her by listening. He really was someone she could trust. He really did know what he was doing. Mm-hmm. And he, he really did care about her. And you can't fake those things. Right. 
And so instead of convincing, see, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Mm -hmm. Trying to convince her to buy the home based on the price and the offer and the buyer was fruitless. Right. Because it didn't have to do with the real reason. That's why listening is the smart thing to do. You bet. I had a story uh, similar to that. I had a client over here in Rancho Bernardo, and he had this house that was essentially going to be a teardown. And so it, was, it was a fabulous lot. He had this house, and I had two buyers. I was my own listing, and I had two buyers who were interested. So I show this one guy in the morning, and this guy was going to eventually, he was going to keep the property for a short period of time and then develop it later on. So he meets the client there, the guy who was a retired postal worker moving to Springfield, Missouri. And we walk around the house, and, and the guy didn't want to talk about the house at all, the owner. He just wanted to show the rose bushes that he had won this prize for. Mm-hmm. The guy I was uh, met there was a builder. He was real kind of, you know, get in, get out, get gone type guy. And uh, so they're talking. He says, yeah, you know, we're going to tent this thing and whatever else, and we'll get it done. It'll look great. And he says, I'm real excited. I'm going to write you an offer today. I want to move on this. It's a good price. I'm going to buy it. He basically told him verbally, I'm going to buy the house full price. The guy says, you're going to tent it? He goes, yeah. He says, you're going to kill all the shrubbery around the house. The guy goes, yeah, well, you know, that, that happens sometimes. He went back. Later on that day, he calls me up, want to write a full price offer. Well, in the afternoon, I'd showed this house to this school teacher who didn't plan on doing anything to the house, even though it was it needed a lot of work. She goes, I'm going to bring this house back. I love this thing. And he's we're talking her through. And she loved his rose bushes. She wrote him an offer that was $8,000 less than the builder. And he would not take the builder's offer. He took the one for eight grand. Ah. Those rose bushes cost that guy the development of that property because the guy told him, these are my prize rose bushes. He didn't hear him. He was looking at the investment. Here's my agenda. The school teacher came in. Oh, I love this. And that was the real reason. That was the real reason. And again, when the offers came in, I'm trying to convince. I'm working for the center. I'm like, hey, this is, uh, you know, it's right. $8,000 more here. And uh, again, this was all this guy could qualify for. And he said, uh, he, he did come through eventually and say, look, the guy wants to hack my rose bushes down. Right. I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? But when I went back to the guy who wrote the offer, nothing happened. I'm going to use that story in my speeches, (laughs) and I'm going to pretend that it's my story. Absolutely. And it's logical to take the extra $8,000. Right. That's logical. Mm -hmm. But it's not emotional. Yeah. It's emotional that that he wants his rose bushes to survive as a legacy beyond him, and that was worth more than $8,000 to him. So if I was looking for a concrete piece of this to say, what should we listen for and to? What would you give me if I, you were giving me like a little formula? OK, I'm a neophyte listener. I'm going on some appointments and you're trying to get me to the point that I'm actually going to do some. What should I listen for? What should I be listening to as I'm sitting there across from the client? All right. You want to listen for what does this person really want? Mm-hmm. Not what they've told you that they really want, but what do they really want? You've got to listen a little deeper because You would think that that guy, what he really wanted was as much money as he could get for his house. Sure. It's not what he really wanted. So you've really got to listen deeper to the message behind the message. How would I do that? This is your gift. How how would you do that with me? All right. I want to know what you really care about. Mm -hmm. I want to know what is your internal motivation. Okay. Now, here's the interesting thing about listening is that you can't fake listening. Right. I have lots of techniques that I could teach you about listening. They're not nearly as important as coming from a listening stance. It's an attitude of the heart. It's an attitude of the heart. Listening is an attitude. It's a frame of mind. It's a stance. It's an approach. It's a way of life. Mm -hmm. So once you believe in caring about people and really understanding what they want and need and really helping them and serving them, then you're coming from a listening place. Mm -hmm. The listening will occur automatically. Now, the techniques I could teach you will augment that, but right. they'll never replace that. Understand. Right? Uh, uh, it's the same with doing business by referral. I mean, the goal is you have got to want to serve people, exceed their expectations, and have a desire to be genuine with those people and treat them as a long-lost friend. If you don't have that attitude, there's no amount of Popeyes, calls, notes, and cards are going to do you any good. you got to have that desire to do it. That's right. Uh, what I've found is I've systemized things to help people get to the next level. What i found is this. And I found this in my own life, Steve. I have a genuine desire to listen. And there are times I have been unsophisticated in how I've gone about it. And so my presumption is that these folks listen. And again, and I think you're right to bring up the point. They have to have the right attitude. Otherwise, the techniques are a waste of time. In fact, they'll probably even look worse 
They'll hurt you. Yeah, they'll yeah. send you backwards. If listening, if you genuinely have a desire to serve, then the techniques or the things that you could give us may help someone like myself or anyone else become a little more sophisticated in how we listen to get to that genuine need that we can meet. Yes. So uh, let me share a few things with Great. you on the how-to, but I just want to impress it again because sure. it's so critical. You can't fake listening. Listening is not a set of techniques. Right. Okay. I don't really like to teach a lot of closing techniques in my right. sales seminar for the same reason. Right. You know, the instant reverse close, the porcupine close, <laughs> the 357 <laughs> magnum close. If I could right. show you a way. Right. <laughs> you know why? Because people know when you're using a technique on Right. Them. Absolutely. Our antenna are tuned for it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how good you are at that technique. If you're using it as a technique with a manipulative yep. attitude, it won't work. I agree. So... What we want to do is listen for the message behind the message. We want to listen not just to the lyrics, mm -hmm. but to the music. Right. Not just to the words that the person is using, but the space between the words. You bet. And not just the logic, but the emotion. In that space between the words, that's where the real reasons lie. That's where the person's internal motivations, their reasons for wanting to do things lie. Their feelings. That's what we're listening for is people's feelings. How do they want to feel in their new home? What did it feel like the last time they had a real home? What did it feel like to you, mm -hmm. Mr. Buyer, the last time you were in a home that felt like a real home to you? What was that like for you? Mm -hmm. And you want to find out what did it feel like? And then you listen to that and you, and you take notes on it, you connect with it. And then when you go out and you are looking for a place for them to live, you call them up again and you say, I found a house mm -hmm. that I think you might feel the way you felt in that other home mm -hmm. that you described and come over and let's take a look at it. And you want to link the feelings that that person had with the other home that they felt so good. And you want to link it to the home that you're showing them now by helping them to remember what it felt like. Mm -hmm. Take them back to that place. Take them back to that place. Sure. Exactly. Now, for me, I've often found that people sometimes will have a hard time telling you what they like but they always know what they hate. So when I was on a listing appointment, I worked a little differently in listing, but I would do this with both buyers and sellers. And oftentimes I'd say, what's your biggest fear or concern about the upcoming transaction? And a lot of times what I found is when I asked them about their fears or concerns, they told me a lot of how I was to serve them. Well, I'm afraid that I'm not going to get my kids in school prior to the house closing. I'm afraid that the market's going to go up and I'm going to be left behind. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that we're going to sell this house and I'm going to not be able to find a house that I really like. And now I'm going to be without a house. I'm afraid of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, it wasn't so much identifying objections that I could then handle, but it, they actually told me how I could serve them. There was clients, even sophisticated clients lived in very expensive homes. They'd say, well, I'm just so afraid I'm not going to be able to find what I like. And I said, well, do you know we have this clause that we can put in a contract that says, the sellers to find suitable housing prior to closing. And that means if we don't find a suitable house for you and your family to move to, we don't have to sell this, even though we've made a contract, because this will be made part of the contract. And you just see the... <sighs> exactly. By telling you what they don't want. Right. Or what they're afraid of, they're also telling you what they do want. Right. Because it's the opposite mm -hmm. of what they just told you. Right. Some people are geared toward telling you what they want to move away from. Right. And some people are geared toward telling you what they want to move toward. Right. Right. And part of listening is to know, is this a moving toward person or a moving away person? <laughs> awesome. Should we talk to them about what they want to avoid or what they want to achieve? Now, here's the exciting thing uh, for someone going on an appointment. Most of the time that I've sit at people's kitchen tables, I find that one of them's a moving forward and one <laughs> of them, you, you know, I'm and you get away, this yeah. and you, the, the, I think the biggest mistake that I've seen in people's dynamic of working with clients is they don't listen. They don't ask. And then they presume who's the decision maker. They presume it. I've seen this a thousand times. Dangerous assumption. Absolutely. Because there's a whole series of conversations that go on after you leave. And, you know, you get the excited <laughs> person. They match up. Well, your personality is just like mine, Steve. And then you got the dry piece of toast sitting in the corner. So I just play to you all the time. Right. And the dry piece of toast is like, yep, ain't working with them after you leave. Right. You're only there for 3% of the sales process. Right. The other 97% mm. goes on when you're not there. Right. That's now, a huge context. And if we took a video camera and videotaped people on this call mm -hmm. in a sales presentation, 
I guarantee you what you're going to see is the salesperson, the agent, talking more than the client mm -hmm. to a degree that they would not even believe unless they saw it on tape themselves. Mm -hmm. They're not just talking 50% of the time, 60, 70. They're talking 80 to 90% of the time, and the client's talking 10, maybe 20% of the time. Yep. Now, if you're not listening, if you're doing most of the talking, then you're not learning anything because you can't learn while you're talking. Sure. Aristotle said wisdom is the reward you get for a lifetime of listening when you would rather have been talking. Could you say that again? Wisdom is the reward you get for a lifetime of listening. Mm. when you would rather have been talking. Brilliant. See, if you're doing most of the talking, Brian, you're not learning about their goals, their dreams, their desires, their aspirations. If you're doing most of the talking, then you won't know any of those things. Mm -hmm. They'll know about your goals and your dreams and your desires as the salesperson, but you won't know about theirs. Right. So you cannot serve them. You cannot sell to them. You cannot help them. This is one of the neat things. I've gotten great feedback just so the folks listening know. Steve has come in and done training for our coaches, and you guys will be very excited to hear that. And uh, we've gotten some fantastic feedback from the coaches just in regards to because the coaches have this desire to serve and to help. And I think you've given them some dynamics to help them go a little deeper with their clients and to really genuinely listen at a deeper level in a more sophisticated way. Then let me share some of the things right now that I shared with some of the coaches okay. about how to listen. Fantastic. And these things that I'm about to share can be a little painful. Okay. But most of our growth, I don't know if you've noticed this, comes through pain, <laughs> yes. not through pleasure, right? Yes. <laughs> I don't know why it was set up that way. When I get my own planet, we're going to learn through pleasure instead of pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Until then, you got to work with the one you <laughs> yeah. have. So how can we become better listeners? Okay. Then? This might surprise you a little bit. Okay. But I have found after teaching listening over and over again for many years that the best way to become a better listener is to become aware of what listening is not. Mm -hmm. The Greek philosopher Zeno said the most important part of learning is to unlearn errors. Mm -hmm. So what I do is as I put I'm about to do this with you now is to put some behaviors in front of us right now that we all engage in that are poor listening. If you're doing these things, you're not listening. Okay. And this is what wakes people up and they say, oh, <laughs> I didn't know that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. That's the main reason, by the way, that we're not good listeners is that we don't know that we don't know. Right. In other words, we're not listening and we're unaware that we're not listening. Sure. So th what I'm about to share with you is for a lot of people, it'll be a BFO. Right. A blinding flash of the obvious, mm -hmm. the aha. All right. So here are some things that if you're engaging in these behaviors, you're not listening. And the okay. first one is I, I call the ATM habit. And an ATM is an automatic teller machine. Yep. <laughs> Automatically telling your story in response to somebody else's story. Right. All right. You're telling somebody about the time <laughs> that, that you <laughs> fell off your bicycle and you got six stitches. How long does it take before they start telling you about the time they fell off their bike? How long? Um, six seconds, yeah. Six, <laughs> Instantaneously. You, you mean six seconds into your story? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, they're not waiting six no. seconds after you're done with your The minute story. I mention bicycle, they're already gone, and you can tell. They're waiting for me to finish so they can jump in right. and finish when, their story. When are you going to finish your boring story so I can tell my exciting <laughs> one? Right? And so why even continue telling your story? They're not there anymore anyway. Yep. They're already and, and, and uh, They're already so gone. I had a guy, I was telling him about my father's spinal surgery. I said, you know, Larry, my father's had three spinal surgeries in the last year, mm. and none of them worked. And I got about that far into it, and he says, oh. My dad, he lives in Florida, and he had spinal surgery, too, and they took bone out of his hip, and they welded it to one of his vertebrae. And I said, Larry. He says, what? I said, Larry, I don't really care <laughs> about your father's spinal surgery. He says, what? He says, why not? And I said, I said, Larry, I was telling you about something that's important to me. Sure. My father and yeah. his spinal surgery. And you interrupted to tell me about your father's spinal surgery. Why should I care? Yeah. See, I'm kind of an assertive communicator. Sure. But the other uh, dynamic is now doesn't it put it in this context where you might have been telling that story for reasons other than the technical aspect of spinal surgery. You might have been communicating that because 
my father's ill. I feel a little bit out of sorts by this. I'm going through a lot. And there's a whole nother realm of other things behind that story, right. which now has just been cut off and it's transactional. Right. And now it's, I'm swapping surgery stories when in fact you might have been communicating a much deeper aspect of here's how I feel. I may be prepared right. for my father passing away. Here's the kicker. Guess what the conversation was actually about is that Larry was selling a product that helps people with back pain. Yeah. And there he is talking about his father and his spinal surgery. Why did he do that? Because we have a habit of automatically telling mm. our story in response to sure. someone else's story. And we have good reasons for it. We think that we're going to connect with the person. We'll have right. something in common. Mm -hmm. But I ask my audiences all over the world, when you're telling someone a story about something that's important to you, you're sharing a problem with someone about something that's important to you. And as soon as you're done, you put the period at the end of your last sentence and they jump in mm -hmm. with their story or they tell you about their problem. How does that make you feel? Mm. And it doesn't matter what country I'm in. I hear the same things over and over again. I feel discounted, disrespected, uncared for, frustrated, like I'm not important. Mm -hmm. And then I ask them a really tough question. If you don't like it when people do that to mm -hmm. you, then why do you do that to them? Sure. We almost all do this behavior. And there are times when it's okay. You know, if you're at a party, if you're at a bar, if you're at a club, you're having fun. People are swapping jokes, swapping stories. Right. Okay. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in a sales situation. If you are having a conversation with a client or a prospect, I want you to imagine that there's a spotlight above your heads, right in between the two of you. Mm-hmm. When the other person is talking, when the client is talking, the spotlight is on them. Great visual. When you start talking about yourself, the spotlight's on you. Mm -hmm. And I call it SOS, spotlight on self. Mm -hmm. You know what SOS means? Yeah. Help. I'm in right. trouble. Right. If the spotlight's on you, you're in trouble in a prospecting or sales conversation. Right. We do this in our personal lives. We do this in sales. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting you mentioned this. I went to an English pub in Richmond, Virginia. And anytime I get a chance to go back and have like food from the old country, whatever else I, so we went to this place called Penny Lane and people from Liverpool are called Scousers. And basically they call Liverpool the capital of Ireland. If everyone went home from Liverpool to Dublin, Dublin would sink. Right. <laughs> and so I walk in and this guy, he's in the restaurant. He's been there since 1958. He's a Scouser. He's got football pictures all over the place and I'm having a great time with him. And being the way they are, I sit down with my group to have lunch. And this guy jumps over. He's the owner of the restaurant. Sits down and starts telling stories. And we then proceeded to be able to just knock out stories one after the other. Da, 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 da. And he would tell a story. And as he got into a story, it brought up something in my mind. And it was absolute ATM teller on acid. Because I would be halfway through my story. And I could even acknowledge in his eyes when he'd heard it before. Right. Okay. And when he was on to his next one. And then I was doing the same thing. Now, again, it was kind of fun, and that's part of the... But the fact of the matter is, that's just as easy to do with a serious conversation. And we get into it with the habits of telling jokes or interacting with people. Right. But isn't it just as, as easy to do in every aspect of everyday life, and even when somebody's communicating the deeper things? And that's when it counts. Mm -hmm. I mean, if somebody is telling you about their sick child, mm -hmm. and they really you know, need somebody to listen just so they can unburden themselves... Right. And halfway through their story, you start telling them about the time your child was sick. Right. It's the opposite of, of serving, of yeah. caring, of loving. Mm -hmm. It's all about me. This is great right. stuff. Hit us with the next well, high fast Well, first here. I want to lay a challenge on okay. everyone that's listening. Okay. It's my first listening challenge. Is, okay. Here it is. The next time somebody tells you a story or a problem about something that's important to them, don't tell your story. Mm-hmm. Now, Brian, I don't mean wait until they're done and then tell your story. I mean, don't tell your story Period. at all. Mm. I had a woman in, in one of my audiences, 2,000 people in the audience. She, I gave him this challenge. She stood up in the middle of 2,000 people and screamed out, what if I explode? <laughs> <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> And everyone could relate to that. Yeah. When you hear somebody tell a story that something reminds you of something that happened to you, all you want to do is tell your story. <laughs> all right, here's the next one. I call it the, the next 
listening behavior or communication behavior that is By not By the way, you're listening. killing me here this morning, man. You realize you're just <laughs> killing me here. I, I'm sinking down below my chair. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry to do that to you. But, uh, the next one is what I call the FAR problem. Mm-hmm. And FAR is an acronym for formulating a response. Mm. And that's thinking about what you're going to say next while the other person is still talking. Mm. The sad part about this one is you can tell, Brian, when you're talking to somebody and they're thinking about what they're going to say next while you're still talking. You know that they're doing that. And so do your clients. Yep. The next one is what I call sentencing. And that is finishing people's sentences for them. (laughs) Now, this is a tough one for for some people because... You often do know what they're going to say next. Sure. Right. I'll just help them out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) People can talk at about uh, 125 words per minute, but Mm -hmm. we listen at four to 500 words per minute. There's Mm -hmm. a big gap there. I'll fill it in. (laughs) I've got a lot of time for my mind to wander. And so that's one of the reasons it's hard to focus on what the other person is saying. And now you're a rapid. Right. Heritage profile kicks in here. Now we got it on acid. Absolutely. Sure. And you're a rapid. Yeah. You're, you're a high velocity person. You think fast, you talk fast, you right. move fast. And if you're with a person that's, what's the opposite of a rapid? A uh, meticulous. A meticulous. They move slow, they think slowly, they talk slowly. It has nothing to do with intelligence. That's just, they talk more slowly. Right. Can drive people like us crazy. Sure. Come on, come on, get to it. I got things to do, <laughs> places to go. And so you want to finish their sentence. Oh, for I feel like I'm. I thing. feel like I'm. I'm helping to give birth to a baby. Right. Sometimes it's like I, 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 <laughs> come on, you, I, can, you can get it, it out. I, it's brutal. <laughs> it's brutal. People. So finishing people's sentences. Yeah. That's sentencing, sentencing. which is a, a brutal term as well. See, listening is paying attention. Mm-hmm. To listen means to pay attention. What are you paying attention to? Mm-hmm. Pay attention to nuances and uh, to the space between the words and to the, you know, an iceberg, 90% of it is underwater. 10% is above the waterline. That's the part you can see. That's like the words that we use. Mm -hmm. And communication is like an iceberg. The words that we use are the 10% that's above the Mm waterline. But the real meaning, the real meat of the communication lies below the waterline. That's where people's beliefs, their values, their characteristics The things in the heritage profile lie below the waterline. Next one is, I call it Mr. Mm Fix-It. And, oh, this is a tough one. Mm. Solving or fixing people's problems for them. When they didn't ask you to solve or fix their problem, and how often do they? Did my family ask you to bring this (laughs) topic up this morning? I just want to know, is this some kind of grand conspiracy? Your your wife called and said, Steve, did did Brian read your book? (laughs) (laughs) Somebody says to you, you know, I'm really feeling anxious and stressed. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, you should try deep breathing. I told my father last year I was giving a speech to 400 judges. Mm -hmm. I gave a speech to the... Florida State Circuit Court Judges Association. Wow. About 400 judges teaching them to listen. And I was nervous about being judged by 400 judges. Sure. Right? <laughs> and I told him, and he said, you'll do fine. And I'm getting ahead of myself. That, that one is called reassuring. Mm-hmm. But it's real similar to Mr. Fix-It. If somebody brings you a problem, you got a problem, I'll solve it. Sure. And we have this overwhelming urge almost to solve the person's problem for them right when all they wanted was somebody to listen to understand Mm -hmm. they needed to unburden to vent to get something off their chest and they didn't ask you to solve their problem the second you solve the person's problem for them is the second that they realize you weren't really listening to them right a woman comes home and tells the husband this is most common about a problem that she had at work and she was frustrated about it And all she wants to do is tell him about it, get it off her chest and get on with their evening. Right. He says, well, here's what you do. Right. Tomorrow when you go into the office, I want you to go to that guy and I want you to tell him this, this and this. He's all puffed up now. He's proud. He's happy. He solved your problem. She goes into the other room and starts telling her girlfriend on the phone about the same problem. He says 40 minutes later, why did you tell her about it? I already already solved your problem. Mm -hmm. You weren't listening to me. Yes, I was. No, you weren't. Right. Uh, How could I have solved your problem if, if I wasn't listening to you? Right. Everybody's heard, you're not listening to me. Mm -hmm. We've all heard that. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, yes, I was. And you repeat back to the person every word they just said, and they still know that you weren't listening. You heard them, but you didn't listen. Right. The dynamic there, here's a problematic situation. 99% of the people listen to this call get paid for solving people's problems. They get paid for it. Yes. That's what they do for a living. It's what I do for a living today. Yes. 
this is our expertise. I'll ask people all across the country, what business are you in? They'll, they'll normally answer, I'm in the problem solving business. Yes. So obviously here, there's a restraint. Would you suggest we're listening to the person to see what their need actually is? And sometimes it's just to, to blow off steam or to, mm -hmm. they need to get this off their chest. Mm -hmm. Would you say you bring the conversation to the point that you're invited in if people really want you to help with the problem? How do you go about that? Same challenge I had in, in uh, doing the sessions with your coaches. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. These are professional problem solvers. Absolutely. They're paid right. to do that. And I asked them, I said, where did we get the idea? Where did people begin to believe that the best way to help someone is to solve their problem for them? Mm -hmm. Where did that belief come from? See, it's not so much that we're in the problem solving business. We're in the helping. Sales is a helping profession. Mm -hmm. Now, if you say that sales is a problem-solving profession, that limits it too much in my mind because sales is so much more than problem-solving. Mm -hmm. I like to say sales is a helping profession. Sometimes the best way you can help someone is to solve their problem, right? but not every time. Right. Now, I said to the coaches, where did we get the idea that the best way to help someone is to solve their problem for them? You see, when you give someone a solution to their problem, or you give them advice, they will argue with it. People will argue with whatever data you give them, mm -hmm. but people never argue with their own data. Correct. If I come up with my own solution, I'm not going to argue with it. Mm -hmm. So the true problem solving, the true helping comes from drawing solutions right. out from within the person. Facilitating that. Facilitating it, mm -hmm. asking them questions and listening, helping them to arrive at their own solutions. Mm. Now, they might not have as many solutions as you do because in the role of a realtor, you have expertise mm -hmm. in an area that they're not knowledgeable about. Right. But what you still want to do is ask questions and listen and then let them know that you understand their problem by asking questions and listening and then present some options. Mm -hmm. It's again more of an attitude than anything else. It's you more bet. of an approach, an attitude. It's fantastic. We are flying along here. After we had Mr. Fix-It, you kind of touched on the assurance uh, process. What is that about? I call that don't worry, be happy. Okay. You know, have you ever been telling someone that you're worried about something? Yeah. And they say to you, don't worry about it? <laughs> they minimize it. Don't worry about that, Brian. Yeah. What, what do you do? Go, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. Now I'm not worried about it. Right. No, you don't do that. Powerful insight. All of a sudden, it takes what I believe, what is a big deal to me, and it's no longer a big deal. And it, it minimizes minimizes it, the whole said. process. Completely yeah, invalidates and minimizes the person. Yeah. Okay. The next one is playing God, what I call <laughs> playing God, which is judging who's right and who's wrong. Mm. In other words, again, it's a stance. Many people go into conversations before the conversation starts because it's their frame of mind of listening in terms of who's right and who's wrong. Mm. Picking uh, a winner and what's right and what's wrong. They have to insert their opinion into every conversation and make a case for it. Again, now, my wonderful bride and a lot of people on this call have the heritage ability called justice. And everything in their life comes down to black and white, right and wrong. Yes. And so, again, it's the restraint of that ability to give deference to I need to serve the other person. And the way I need to serve the other person is not make or pass judgment at this time. Very, very, very painful and difficult thing for a justice person to do mm. is to listen and to recognize that one of the principles I teach in my listening seminars is that other people don't see the world the way you do. Correct. Very difficult mm -hmm. lesson to learn. You bet. And Gerald Jampolsky in his book, Love is Letting Go of Fear, asked one of the most powerful questions I've ever heard. Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Mm. Can you say that again? <laughs> do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Wow. Two more quick ones, Brian. Okay. The next one is what I call me, 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 me. <laughs> and that is turning the conversation back to yourself no matter what it's about. <laughs> My favorite subject. My favorite me, subject. Me, myself, and I. So, hey, Brian, enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? <laughs> I have heard we were in a business consulting meeting not too long ago. And that joke you just made, uh -huh. a business consultant did for real. Wow. I am not kidding you. They, <laughs> and we were looking at each other. This has got to be a joke. And this was a business consultant that's paid to do this uh -huh. and who asked that exact question. Yeah. Enough about me. What do you think about what I said? <laughs> I am Beautiful. not kidding you. 
<laughs> oh, here's a dangerous one. It's called mind reading. Hmm. Mind reading is thinking that you know the other person's intentions. Hmm. There's nothing more destructive in human relations, especially with those we love, yep. than telling them, I know what your intentions are. Mm -hmm. Or I know what your intentions were when you did this or when you said this. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So the key there is to check first. And you can say to the person, you know, when you did this, the assumption I made is that you were doing this. Right. That, that this was your intentions. That's the assumption I made. Is that correct? Right. What I'm hearing you say is. Mm -hmm. And is this the content? Is this the intent? Right. Am I on track? Right. All right. Great stuff. I will tell you this. Of the notes that I've taken here today, I know that for me personally, I have more to do and more work to do than any other conference call we've ever done any book that I've read, this right now, I would say I'm most wanting in this area, in most need of the help in this area, and I am personally going to take this on as my project to try to grow in this area. I thank you for your gift, Steve. I thank you for blessing these people and coming on here today. Uh, you're going to help a lot of people in their business and in their lives, and I, and I appreciate what, all you've done for us. It's been my honor. Fantastic. Thanks to everybody being here today. Listen to the tape a number of times. God bless. Until we talk again, happy listening. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's show. Great insights from the late Steve Shapiro.